The Business of Agriculture podcast is brought to you by Land Trust. Did you know sportsmen spend over $5 billion annually in hunter and angler access fees? Land Trust is a platform that connects sportsmen with farmers and ranchers like you who have untapped profits just by providing access to their land. Go to landtrust.com slash BOA, as in business of agriculture, to see how much you might add to your bottom line. Greetings and thank you for joining us here on the Business of Agriculture podcast. It's me, your host, Damian Mason, but you knew that because you've been tuning in forever, right? We're pushing 200 episodes of this wonderful podcast. So I'm glad you are joining us here today because I got a great show for you. We're talking about promotion. We're talking about marketing. You know, we're really good in agriculture about making our products. We make the heck out of our products, but We've got to continue to think like the customer because we are not our own consumer. We are our producer. We're the factory. We are amazing at it, but we got to promote this product to, so that we can continue to get good premiums and sell our product to our consumers. So with that in mind, I have a show all about promotion, specifically about cheese. That's right. Smile and say cheese. I've got Suzanne Fanning. She's the chief marketing officer for Wisconsin Cheese. They came on my radar because they won a, an award, an advertising award, something novel, something different, something that frankly we miss in agriculture because we get so caught up in production, we forget about the promotion part of it. Suzanne Fanning, welcome to the show. Are you ready to talk about promotion marketing as it relates to cheese today? I am always ready to talk about marketing cheese, definitely. And it sounds like Damien, you and I, when it comes to marketing, are definitely kindred spirits. So I think we're going to have a great conversation today. We're going, have a, we're going to have an amazing conversation. And again, folks, you know, while we're talking about cheese, this applies to any commodity group because Suzanne, I've got folks uh, that are, you know, from cotton to cranberries uh, and everywhere in between that listen to this podcast. And we always push the idea that we are pushing the business side of it. And that's why I saw this article about you and what you're doing. I thought this will be fantastic. So Suzanne, before we get to our questions, I want to remind the listeners that besides Land Trust that you heard in the intro uh, being a sponsor, we've got also my longtime sponsor, Harvest Profit. Harvest Profit is a software solution for your agricultural enterprise. Nick Horub started the company because he said, I see a need in the marketplace where agricultural enterprises don't have adequate software to manage their inputs, their throughputs, their outputs. You know what? This is a business after all. I'm going to help them become more profitable. So he founded Harvest Profit. You can go to harvestprofit.com and get a free 14-day trial using their product to see if it will work for you. Okay, Suzanne, I'm uh, I'm kicking around. I'm one of those um, grazers, if you will. I'm a former political comedian. Political comedy taught me to always look at everything, read, observe, check out headlines, and go to other sources. Where are people not looking? And then sort of connect the dots. Uh, a person presented something to me. Said, "Hey, have you heard about this? Cheese Landia? Uh, some and you won the advertising award." And I'm like, "This is more what we need to see. We need to see." a new look on how to sell our product. So I read about it. I went to the website. Of course, I knew about Wisconsin dairy. I mean, let's face it. It's America's dairy land. It says so on the, on the license plates up there. You are working as a chief marketing officer for Wisconsin cheese. You have another role up there. And I want you to tell me a bit about you. And then we're going to talk about the initiatives. Absolutely. So I am the Senior Vice President for Dairy Farmers of Wisconsin, which is a checkoff organization here in Wisconsin. And I am the Chief Marketing Officer for Wisconsin Cheese, as you said, because that is our consumer facing brand. So that is not one brand of cheese that is over 600 type styles and varieties of cheeses in Wisconsin cheeses that are made with good old Wisconsin milk. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. 600 varieties of cheese. I'm thinking, wait a minute, you know, let's take a little pauser here because we got folks that are not in the cheese business listening. You're going, wait a minute, Munster, Colby, Cheddar, Swiss. Wait a minute, where's the other 596 coming from? So that's great. That's awesome. In Wisconsin, um, you, you get back to you before we get into the actual product stuff. You don't come from a checkoff program background. You come from a corporate background. Give me a little scoop on Suzanne. 
That is correct. I come from a corporate background and our CEO, Chad Vincent, comes from a corporate background. And so we probably run things maybe a little bit differently than some of the checkoff organizations. We run it more like a branded business and we definitely like hold people to KPIs. We're pushing strong goals and stretch goals and things like that. So a lot of the time people will say, wow, Wisconsin seems seems different than some of the other ones. And that's probably why that's the big difference. And it's it's our it's our backgrounds. A little background also, are you a Wisconsin girl? I have been in Wisconsin for over 20 years. So people call me, I would. I was actually a military brat growing up. So I moved all over the place, but I've been here for 20 years. So um, the joke is I'm a processed cheese head. <laughs> I like it, I like it. So processed cheese head and, uh, and you're, doing, you're doing this job here. So you've been in this role for how long? I've been in this role for a little over four years now. I joined okay. right after our new CEO joined as well. Chad Vincent, the new CEO. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I like I like what you're doing, like the way you're taking it on, because uh, uh, we can talk about that a little later, about some of the problems as I see them with the checkoff programs is uh, they don't think like branded products, they don't think like marketers, and they don't, uh, uh, they're afraid to take a new stand on things. You've got- oh, well, is you'll love some of the things we're doing. Yeah, I do love it. That's why that's why you're on here because you're taking you're taking a stand. You're doing stuff a little different. You're pushing the envelope. And uh, and and have you gotten any res resentment from any of the the producers? Do you do you have people say, "Hey, man, I don't." It seems like you're getting a little edgy out here. I just want you to put happy cows on TV. What's that all about? <laughs> Um, no, well, actually, personally, we do think that Wisconsin has the happiest cow. So I don't even think we're going to touch that that particular campaign. But I mean, we have received so many great accolades and so many results and not even just from within the ag industry, but just advertising in general, like you mentioned, uh, Ad Age selected us as the, uh, the, the best influencer campaign of the entire year. And that's not something we applied for. That's just something that came across their radar and they saw and they said, wow, this group is doing something innovative. But Damien, you know what? The other winners in that, did you look at them? It's like Nike and yeah. Peloton and yeah. Zoom and then little dairy farmers of Wisconsin. So yeah. it is. Yeah, you were, you were in some pretty good company private. when you're talking about, com uh, you know, organizations, private companies or, you know, publicly held companies, if you will, but in the private sector that are that are putting out some pretty, uh, you know, some pretty name recognition, uh, you know, household brand name kind of stuff like Nike, et cetera. All right. Let's tell me about let's let's go with what you the reason I heard about you was Cheeselandia, but let's start a little bit before that. Wisconsin Dairy in, in a nutshell, and then what you are doing. Okay, so, all right, we'll start back from the very beginning. So in Wisconsin, dairy is obviously very important. It's not something that we do, it's who we are. Our industry is four times as big as, as oranges are to Florida. So when you put it in perspective, I mean, it's it's a huge key economic driver of our state. So um, it, it impacts a lot. In Wisconsin, we are unique because 90% of the milk that we produce goes into making cheese. Now, on top of that, 90% of that cheese is sold outside of the state's borders. So that's why when you look at our efforts, they are a little bit different. We're focused on driving demand for Wisconsin cheese nationwide. So that, yeah. that's what our efforts are aimed at. And since I'm, I'm a dairy farm background and, you know, was raised on a dairy farm, I rent my farmland to a dairy farm. You and I were just mentioning that before we started recording. So to the listener, that's, you know, I've got a lot of non-ag people that listen to this podcast as their source of what's going on in the business of agriculture. What you just said is really interesting, Suzanne. 90% of the milk produced in Wisconsin goes to cheese and 90% of the cheese is not sold in Wisconsin, even though we can go on any pull off of, uh, of the interstate there, you know, you go to Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, and there's like, there's, there's more cheese places than, than you've ever seen in your life. But most of your stuff does not stay in Wisconsin. Uh, also, it's important for the non ag listener, Wisconsin, even though it's America's airline is the number two producer, California makes more milk than Wisconsin, but obviously, we've always known Wisconsin to be the dairy state, you just said something very interesting, that it's four times more important to you milk in in the state of Wisconsin than oranges are to Florida. You see, while California makes more milk, California has a lot more stuff going on and a lot more people. So there's what seven and a half million people, seven million people in Wisconsin, six million, whatever the number is. Cheese is very important up there. You get a lot of buy-in from your people. Wisconsin is cheese, but 
you were brought in four years ago and you said, now what? You could have just plodded along and done the same thing. You started changing stuff up. Tell me about what your work looks like. Yeah, let's talk about that. That's great. Well, I think when you start with any kind of a branded business, you want to take a look at, at what's happening right now. So we did a lot of research to find out what do consumers really think about Wisconsin cheese? And I'll tell you, there was good news and there was bad news. So the good news was that when consumers think about cheese, they do think about Wisconsin, right? They do, they do kind of put those two together. The bad news was, though, that they really thought about, I mean, the adjectives that they used were kind of like ordinary, everyday. They didn't use those high-end words like indulgent, sophisticated, and things like that. But I got to tell you, just, you know, if you think you know Wisconsin cheese, this goes to show that people just really don't because Wisconsin in reality wins more awards than any other state or country. I mean, we consistently win uh, first place at all of the worldwide championships championships for sure. And you're we talking also, about for the actual product of cheese, not in not, you, you got you got an award for your advertising campaign, but the cheese also gets awards. Yeah. Well, you know what? It all starts, it all starts with the farmers and the cheese. So we'll we'll get to the advertising stuff later. So we can talk a little bit about how how we built the plan that that we're executing right now. So when we realized that people thought that the cheese was everyday and ordinary, and like I said, we win more awards than any state or country. We are the only place outside of Switzerland where you can become a master cheese maker. Wisconsin is the only state that requires a license to make cheese. I mean, there's so much. We are basically we're just a state that is completely obsessed with cheese. I mean, that's true. We're, we're that one place. It's it's not something that we do. It literally is who we are. It's in our blood. So we realized what we really needed to do was to close that perception gap to make sure that people didn't just brush us off as ordinary and every day. You know, it's interesting because we talked about the 600 type styles and varieties. So I, I can even go backwards from Cheeselandia a little bit. And this is something you might not have heard of. But when we first wanted to tell that story, we said, yes, we need to let people know about all these different cheeses that we have that were not just giant blocks of cheddar, which is what people were thinking. And and so we actually broke a Guinness World Record. I don't know if you heard about that. No, I didn't. Um, yeah, we did. So um, we built the world's largest cheese board. And this particular title had never been held in the U.S. before. We did it right downtown in, in Madison, Wisconsin. And we had about 40,000 people there to watch. We had the guys from Guinness World Records there. We were weighing all the cheese. It was very exciting. We built a <laughs> barn right in the middle of downtown. And and yes, we announced it. It was a ma it got major news coverage. In fact, we were on late night with Seth Meyers. We were on Fox News. We were it was picked up all over the country. People were fascinated with this gigantic cheese board. And we began began seeing headlines like this is the most Wisconsin thing you'll ever see. And, you know, it's so true. And I think that was the, the kickoff of our um, grand reintroduction to the world was like, look at all this amazing cheese we've got. Yeah, I, I like it. So, which leads us to Cheeselandia, which is how, oh, I, you know, I read an article about you achieving this award. That's just one component of what your promotion looks like to sell, you know, the product of Wisconsin dairy producers. Tell me about Cheeselandia. Yeah, I would love to. So, you know, when it goes to changing perceptions, there's only so much that advertising can really do because consumers just inherently don't trust brands anymore. And I think we all see that. We also know that in the old days, it was great to have a television commercial because people were sitting in front of the TV and they watched it straight through. Now we're living in a world where people will pay a premium to skip your advertisement. So you've got to find other and more creative ways Ways to reach the consumer. And one pl place that you really can't overlook, and I feel like too many brands do, is word of mouth. Because really, what consumers believe is what other consumers tell them. In fact, according to Nielsen, 92% of consumers believe word of mouth, believe friends and family over any other form of advertising, over banner ads, over just over everything. Um, I think only about half of the people believe the TV commercials that they see, and as expensive as that is. So we said, you know what, we're going to really push this word of mouth and we're going to find those genuine authentic fans we didn't go the way that a lot of brands go so a lot of brands are like finding influencers who have hundreds of thousands of fans they're writing them check and they're saying say something 
about us. And we said, you know what? We don't have to buy our friends here in Wisconsin. We're all about authenticity. So let's find those super fans all across the nation. And oh my gosh, there are so many, either people who are expats who used to live here, people who have traveled here, people who are just cheese lovers in general. I mean, there are so many fans of Wisconsin cheese out there. So we kind of banded them together and formed this incredible community. And what we feel is that while we might may not all live in Wisconsin, a little wedge of Wisconsin lives inside all of us. And so there are so many opportunities for cheese landians to, to get together virtually, to get together in person, to have cheese parties in their homes, to share the cheeses with their friends, to talk online, to talk on their local TV stations. I mean, it is just, it's wide open. The, okay, um, now wait, now real wide. quickly, I want to say a little wedge of Wisconsin lives in all of us. It's probably the most brilliant sound but you've come up with so far in our 15 minutes together. Second thing I want to ask then, and then we're going to take a teeny little uh, uh, departure from this. <clears throat> you assembled people, as you pointed out, uh, you know, Instagram influencer, I'm a social media influencer. And then we see this in ag all the time, frankly, there's these agricultural people that have, you know, a big following. And then they essentially uh, go into, and, and then call themselves influencers and then sell, uh, you know, uh, uh, just uh, Justin boots, you know, or whatever they get a check cut to them. And then they are, uh, you know, pushing to their own followers, the uh, stuff you didn't do that. You found cheese people, you found cheese people and said, I want to put you together because I want you to be my base. Is that kind of the idea? That, that's exactly right. And we wanted to get to know them. <laughs> we wanted to know what motivates them and we want to provide experiences that are so incredible for them that they're just compelled naturally to talk about our cheeses. So it's not because we wrote them a check, it's because they're a part of this community. We had an online event last night and it was a regional event just for cheese landians in the northeastern portion of the country. And we had people on there that were saying, I talk about cheese landia so much. Everybody at work wants to join cheese landia. My family is sick of hearing me talk about cheese landia. So we're, we're I mean, you know what? I'm just going to come out and say it, Damien. We're just that cool that they just want to talk about us. How many cheese landians are there? We've got about 4,000 now, and we try. We make it kind of hard to join. We don't want it to be like a, a Facebook group that you just click and boom, you're in. We ask them questions, ask for pictures, talk about their feelings about cheese. So we intentionally make it a little more difficult to join this community. It's, an exclusive, it's, a, it's the country club of cheese eaters i got there you it go. there you go <laughs> all right um i'm talking to suzanne fanning the chief marketing officer of wisconsin cheese and we're going to get into what dairy is doing good what dairy is doing uh, bad what uh what uh, we can look forward to a new marketing campaign some of the mistakes that we've made in agriculture we'll get to all that but i want to remind you before we get there because somebody's got to pay the bills Harvest profit please i know you hear me talk about it there's one thing that you uh maybe haven't heard me talk as much about Nick Horb is the founder of this company, Harvest Profit. Again, it's a software solution for agricultural enterprises. So it's all about keeping all your ducks in a row, man, all your, your money, your, you know, your inputs, your outputs, the, the farms that you farm. You can do all that with their software. But I encourage you to go to harvestprofit.com for another reason. Nick's very thoughtful about taking uh, his messages about improving your life and business, and he puts together little short articles on his website. So, you know, even if you don't buy the product, go to harvestprofit.com and see what Nick has to say because he's done a really good job of always understanding that without a customer and and solving their problem there's no need for his business so i think well of him and i think well of the company go to harvestprofit.com and read some of the stuff that you might be able to apply to your own business it's only like 400 word articles so it'll take you like one and a half to two and a half minutes to read one of them and i'm sure you'll find something that is uh, helpful to you suzanne <clears throat> um cheese consumption because I'm a food guy, an ag guy, talk about these things in my book, Food Fear, which I, of course, have to mention in every episode. Also need to mention every episode that we're not just an audio podcast. We're also a video podcast. That means you can go to the Damian Mason channel on YouTube and hit subscribe, and you'll see all of the episodes of the Business of Agriculture for the last 16 months. Uh, about three times, three times cheese production since I was born, roughly, in 1969, uh, that's a very good thing for dairy. Are we going to be able to eat more cheese or are we pretty well at cheese capacity in terms of our consumer? 
All right, I'm gonna vote yes. We we can continue to grow the cheese market, absolutely. Um, year over year, people are eating more cheese. We've seen a 9.9% .9 retail sales growth since 2019. And I think we're also looking at ways to do some international expansion. So there's a, there's a lot of cool stuff happening. 2020 was a particularly interesting year and our cheese sales jumped 13.1% in 2020 compared to the year prior. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, and there give, are me lot of things again. give me those numbers again. 2020. Uh, in 2020, the dairy consumption skyrocketed and, and our sales jumped by about 13.1%. Is that nationally or through Wisconsin? That is nationally. In cheese National or, cheese sales. That was cheese. Let, cheese yeah, sales were 13%. Yeah. So, and let's talk about like kind of what happened during the pandemic year, because it was an interesting year for cheese. I think we all started out very devastated, of course, because of the decline in, in restaurants and everything. But what we saw is that what we kind of lacked in food service, we picked up a lot in retail. People wanted to treat themselves particularly to some specialty cheese. So there's the comfort boom where you're saying, wow, the world is making me really uncomfortable right now. And so I want to go back to like my childhood and what made me happy and what made people happy, grilled cheese sandwiches, macaroni and cheese, lots of those kind of things. But we saw it kind of on the high end side as well, because folks had like money saved up that they were going to spend on vacations and, you know, all kind and things that they couldn't do just going to movies, going out to dinner. And they said, you know what, I'm going to spend my money to, to indulge myself at home. And if that oh. means buying high end specialty cheese, I'm doing it. Yeah, by the way, my wife and I eat better cheese certainly than I did growing up. You know, we had a block of Colby growing up and uh now my wife and I are more well off than certainly I we were uh, as kids being raised in the uh, blue collar uh, background in Indiana. Uh and I go and get some of this good cheese and I I do exactly what you're talking about and uh man, Welsh cheddar and uh it, it's crumbly and it falls apart and it's like, "Oh my God, this stuff, it's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, better Swisses. I, I, I'm all with what you're talking about there. So cheese isn't an indulgence. So really we got kind of the, it's kind of like you've got the base level Kroger brand cheese and then you got the higher end stuff. Uh, does the growth, did the growth happen across the board or was it more on the high end stuff? So the growth did happen across the board, but specialty cheese sales in particular were up and that was great. And I'm happy to report that Wisconsin specialty cheese sales outpaced the entire category. So um, hopefully we're doing something right here in Wisconsin. Hey, Damien, though, I do want to go back to something that you said, because I loved it. So you, you talked about like good old fashioned Colby and definitely I'm, I'm a Colby fan, but just for the listeners out there, I'm sure you already know this. Colby is a Wisconsin original and it was invented in Colby, Wisconsin. So again, like we're a place that not only makes cheese, we're a place that invents new cheeses. I like it. Uh, so cheese consumption went up. Dairy in general, you know, I'm a dairy farm guy and, and, and whatnot. Milk uh, had been declining forever from, since the end of World War II. We've gone from 48 gallons of milk consumption per American to 16, roughly, last I looked. But then we bumped a little bit. Pandemic comes along, people are at home feeding their kids cereal. It's, it, and so milk went through this huge bump for about a month or so. Then we pretty well stabilized, I think. Does milk continue to decline or does it stabilize or does it, go, is it, is it end up going up? What's your prediction on fluid milk? Well, okay, so I will tell you that today's consumer is more likely to eat their dairy than to drink it just with what we're seeing. And there are so many, so many factors that are contributing to that. There are changing demographics. There's a changing family structure, so much more like non-traditional than it used to be than the family and the jug of milk right in the middle. I know when I was little, we had milk every single night and we had to drink it before, you know, we could leave the table and, and families are just looking very, very different today. So yes, fluid milk consumption has uh, had a decline. However, um, over the past 40 years, Americans have increased their total dairy consumption by about 20%. Yeah. So what does that mean? It means like since 1980, for instance, butter consumption is up about 37%. Cheese consumption has more than doubled from 18 pounds to 38 pounds per year. Yogurt consumption has more than quadrupled yeah. since 1980 from two and a half pounds in 1980 to about 13 pounds four pounds now so which one is 13.4 pounds 
that is yogurt. Yogurt, yeah, because I'd say a lot of that consumption, certainly cheese we already talked about, and then on uh, yogurt. Um, what marketing works and what doesn't? Um, what if, you know, you've been there for four years, but you've been around what, what marketing works and what doesn't you talked about word of mouth. Well, that's neat, but I always say there's no such thing as word of mouth, Suzanne. There's a thing <laughs> called word. Well, cause there isn't, I mean, I think it's insulting to say that and I take hear this the right way. I'm not saying that what you said is wrong. I just tell people when they say, Damien, you've been out here working for 27 years. You're pretty successful. Just pretty much rely on word of mouth. I'm like, well, that's insulting. It's, word of a hard earned reputation. It's word of, it's not word of mouth because that implies that somebody just drives on and says, hey, you ought to go and do this. No, it's that they had a positive experience. It's that you delivered on the promise. It's that you delivered the value that they want and then they speak well of you because you are consistently delivering on something. So I look at more of a, you've done what you were asked to do. So that's why they say good things about you. Wisconsin Cheese has done that. What work, what marketing works and what marketing doesn't? Okay, I'm going to jump on what you just said because it's too fun not to jump on it. You are talking to a former president of the Word of Mouth Marketing Association. So I have strong feelings here. And I would say there's there's a difference between word of mouth and word of mouth marketing. So, so we can kind of talk about that a little bit. Um, yes, word of mouth is that conversation. Word of mouth marketing is kind of what we talked about before, that you're doing something to get a consumer to tell another consumer about you. So I do, I definitely feel like word of mouth marketing exists to drive word of mouth so that you are getting those recommendations so that people are talking about you so that people are saying, man, you got to try that restaurant. So I would say that word of mouth exists, but to your point, yes, it's driven by like this hard work and this incredible marketing. And I think people don't understand what goes behind pushing that word of mouth. The best companies in the world, the most successful brands really work to amplify then that word of mouth to show that consumers really love them. Reviews, those are word, word of mouth. So I would, we can agree to disagree, but maybe we're just looking at it a little bit differently. No, I don't think we disagree. It's again, there's no such thing as somebody just magically starts going around promoting your product for the hell of it. They do it because they've had a positive experience with the product and because the product has proven itself in the marketplace. So we're both saying the same thing from a different direction. Um, and I, I love that. So like, okay, so I, I love to look back at like wonder bread right because the the people love that expression it's the greatest thing since sliced bread right yeah, but right, when right. sliced bread was invented originally it was a it was a flop because they didn't have any word of mouth so it wasn't until wonder bread came along with their sliced bread and marketed it to moms and then all of a sudden moms started saying to each other and to the world like holy moly, this is so much better than having to slice my own bread. It's so sure. much quicker to make a sandwich. So yeah. word of mouth is, is what made sliced bread like this iconic example. The greatest, thing, the greatest thing since sliced bread, right up there with another thing since you're in Wisconsin, the, the best, the greatest thing since canned beer, because there was a time when you had to just go, you had to go to a tavern and fill a jug, which happens again. Um, Marketing that works besides word of mouth. You're doing some interesting stuff. Um, are you doing anything edgy? Because ag is usually steered away from anything edgy. I mean, we definitely gravitate towards edgy. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be honest with you. I think let, let me just give you let me give you an example. Um it used to be that the organization spent a lot of time going to like cheese festivals. And so what they would do is they would um and, and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with it. I'm just going to tell you how we view it now versus kind of maybe how it was looked at before. So there'd be a huge cheese festival. The Our organization would go, we'd take a six-foot table and put it next to about 200 other six-foot tables. Everybody would have their little cubes of cheese. And then a few hundred people would come through and then try the cheeses from all of the hundreds of tables that were around. Wasn't really, I don't know that people left with like a good impression of like what was with Wisconsin versus what was from California or what was from Vermont or what came from Utah, like who even knows because right. we all looked alike. And I think after seeing a couple of those, we made a decision to say, you know what, 
We're never going to blend in again. We're never going to be well behaved. We're never going to stand at a six foot table in a line of six foot tables and serve cheese just like everybody else does. So we completely scrapped that. And we said, we're going to seek out places where people are going to be surprised to discover Wisconsin cheese. And one of the first places we did that was at South by Southwest, which I'm sure you're familiar with in Austin, Texas, this big interactive film and tech festival. I mean, it's, it's an incredible thing. And it is literally where gigantic brands go with millions of dollars to launch huge campaigns. So HBO will go and do an activate. I right. mean, there's just tons. People build houses, so, people do all kinds you, of stuff. And you know, we talk about the higher end consumer. One of the things that I've pointed out to all of my ag audiences, consultation, people that hire me to be, uh, you know, the consultant, whatever, we tend to still think that um, it's all about how cheap we can be. Certainly the South by Southwest crowd, a technology and business and entertainment um, uh, hub that you will uh, conference, that is not a low end consumer. There's a high end consumer. And we continually think sometimes in ag, it's about how cheap we can be and talk about how cheap their food is. But that's a consumer that wants a story. They want an experience. So you can sell them on the on, on a lot of stuff there how was the experience when you went there oh boy i can't wait to tell you so yes we've got brands that are the spending millions of dollars competing for attention and i know like i i follow south by southwest and i have for years and it's people are like hard on it like if you have an activation and they don't like it and it can be like a branded everything with a limo picking you up and and a special house built for this like they will tell you if they don't like it we did not go with limos and houses and all of that stuff. We went with cheese. We went with several thousand pounds of cheese and we created an incredible display. We built an experience that really did tell the story of Wisconsin and made people feel like they were in Wisconsin. In fact, one year we even built a pop-up Wisconsin State Fair in the middle of um, in the middle of South by Southwest. People came, they responded, they were like skipping major sessions to stay in line for hours to get into our room. It was the most popular lounge in South by Southwest history. It is the only time they've ever had to call security to manage a lounge line because it was so long and people were happy to stand in line to get into what was the ultimate cheese fantasy. It was so talked about that all of a sudden when you Google and it, this was a, this was amazing. Like I'd like to say I could I saw this coming, but this really did amaze me and exceeded my my ultimate fantasies. If you Googled Elon Musk, you would get Elon Musk and Wisconsin cheese. If you Googled This Is Us, which the first year we went, that was the hottest show on TV. It said what I learned at South by. This is us and Wisconsin cheese. We were everywhere. We received so much coverage, so many mentions, so much word of mouth. I mean, it was it was incredible. So uh, here's something that you and I both talked about before we started, and uh, I think it's important. <clears throat> Agriculture, especially these checkoff programs, in my uh, observation uh, for my entire life being around agriculture, um, we do a lot of preaching to the choir. There is not at South by Southwest, there was not one dairy farmer. There was probably not one farmer. There was not one dairy farmer, probably not one farmer at the South by Southwest conference, one of the biggest, if not the, certainly one of the biggest name brand trade show conferences, conventions in the United States every year. You went to where the consumer is, where a different consumer is. Am I right? Do we just preach the choir too much and not really understand how to get out where the customer is? Well, let me just say, like, the reason that we are here is to be tireless advocates for our dairy farmers. I mean, these families are just, they are too busy, like, feeding the world, running their farm to have to worry about marketing. And so we feel like we're here to do things, to focus on SEO so that when you put in cheese, Wisconsin comes up, to focus on building great content. In the, in the time that I've been there, we've actually increased our social engagement by 4,000%. We worry about meeting with editors so that they don't have to. And we've been averaging about $50 million in earned media on like amazing shows. Kelly Clarkson, Drew Barrymore, The Today Show, Fox News. We, I already mentioned Late Night with Seth Meyers. So like farmers just don't have time to do that. And, and that's what we're here for. So we are really proud to serve them. But you're right. We don't necessarily 
talk to the farmers. And in some cases, we don't even talk so much to Wisconsin because the farmers know and Wisconsin knows how fabulous our cheese is. It's those guys everywhere else in the other 49 states that need to hear the story and need to make, we need to make sure that they are compelled to purchase when they see that proudly Wisconsin cheese badge. We need to make sure they know that it stands for quality and the very best cheese in the world. So that's what ever, we're trying to do. Suzanne, do you ever hear from your dairy producers or dairy industry people in Wisconsin? Like, hey, how come I'm not seeing your, your stuff? And you're saying, because you don't go to South by Southwest because you don't don't tune into this. Do you have to, you ever on the defensive? Um, well, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a defensive, but I will say we get a lot of those questions and I love those questions because I think you can see that there is nothing I love more than to talk about our efforts and to talk about how effective they are and to talk about the cool things that we are doing on behalf of our incredible dairy farmers. And so I consider those questions a gift because I would much rather people come out and, and say it and ask it so that we can have a conversation and I can share because absolutely it's, it's not evident to them what we're doing right. and we want to be able to share that story. So we do it through like Facebook. We have a, a Facebook set up. We have a newsletter. We have an annual report that's a calendar that goes out so they can hang it on their wall to remind them of some of the different things. But for many of them, yeah, I mean, they're kind of head down in their business and it's hard for them to know what their checkoff dollars are doing. So there's nothing I like more than the ability to answer that question. Suzanne Fanning, we're going to get here wrapping things up. She's the chief marketing officer of Wisconsin Cheese. Talk about marketing agricultural products. When you look at what uh, what ag commodity groups do right, are you going to answer it? What do they do right and what do they do wrong when it comes to marketing? Well, it's going to be hard for me to judge other ones. I can't necessarily say like what what everybody's doing and, and I'm I'm not in their shoes so it's hard for me to guess but I would say for one thing authenticity definitely wins so be authentic I would also say like don't be afraid to say something because there are a lot of people out there there are a lot of negative voices and if we don't like sort of fill the void with positive agriculture messages, then they're going to fill it with some negative messages. So I'd say like, let's make sure that we do all band together and tell our story. I think that's the most important thing. You and I'll disagree on that. I don't think the consumer cares about our story. I think the consumer cares about themselves. And uh, the consumer usually wants to uh, buy a product that says something about them. I don't know that, that uh, the story of somebody going out and feeding calves really matters much to the consumer. So we might disagree on that, but that's okay because we both have different <laughs> opinions on marketing stuff. Suzanne Fanning, last thing that we didn't talk about that we should have when it relates to marketing and or um, what you're seeing there on the, on the ground doing your work with Wisconsin Merit Dairy Products. I'm sorry, what was the question? What what thing did we not cover that you want to share that you think is a good point that we, we need to understand about marketing from your position? What are you seeing? What what thing does the agricultural business person need to think about? Well, I think for us, at least like our farmers and things, I would say just make sure that you like understand checkoff. So get the answers to your questions. Ask the questions that you need answered. Visit the website, subscribe to the newsletter, follow us on social, go to our dairybuzz.com so that you can understand like what cool publicity we're getting. Read the report, know your director, call us. So get involved, I guess would be my key message. Her name's Suzanne Fanning, all about Wisconsin cheese. 90% of Wisconsin milk goes to cheese and 90% doesn't stay in Wisconsin. I've got these notes written down. Um, anyway, I uh, I think that we uh, need to always continue to think about the, the consumer and what drives the consumer to buy our products. Remember, uh, agriculture, we've got this whole thing about thank a farmer. We need to really reverse that thinking. It's going to be thank a consumer because they are the reason for us. And uh, and, and we got to make sure that we're always doing what we can to, to move our product to them and uh, begins with a good marketing and promotion. Cheeselandia. So if they want to check that out, where do they go and check this stuff out? So go to cheeselandia.com to register and read about it. And, and we're kind of everywhere. It's not platform specific, but I would say the best place to see the activities and the people and kind of what's going on and what they're posting is Instagram. So go to Instagram and look at, at the at Cheeselandia account and you'll see some of our incredible Cheeselandians, but definitely get involved because there's like no, no platform and there's no page that can capture all the incredible things that, that we're doing with these great people. And if anybody wants to contact you because they say, hey, I got an idea. Are you okay with them calling time to you? 
Absolutely. How do they find Suzanne Fanning? So you can, uh, well, wow, you know, today you can reach people so many different ways. So on Twitter, it's at Sue's Fan, so you can look there. My email address is sfanning at wisconsindairy.org. Those are probably the two best ways to reach out to me. Fantastic. This podcast was sponsored by my friends at harvestprofit.com. You've already heard about Harvest Profit. Harvest Profit, uh, I, I'm sorry, it's Harvest Profit. It's not harvestprofit.com, but that is their website. So anyway, go to harvestprofit.com and check out their software and see if it's something that you can use because I'm sure it's going to help your business do what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to be profitable. Remember, there is no legacy. There is none of this whole thing about lifestyle. If there's not business that actually runs like a business in agriculture, run your business like a business and do so with the right software that'll help you harvest profit. Go to harvestprofit.com for a free 14 day trial. All right. Her name's Suzanne Fanning. She's awesome. I really appreciate her being there. We disagreed on a few things, but you know what? Put two different marketing minded, promotional minded people in the same room and you're going to get some different ideas. And that's a good thing because when you have a bunch of yes men, which is what, in my opinion, the checkoff program suffers from a lot of head nodders saying, oh yeah, that's a great idea. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden you don't have any new creativity. Am I right, Suzanne? I mean, Damien, at this point, I'm thinking we need to like co-host a he said, she said show. I mean, I found it amazingly entertaining. And I like I it. Going. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I like it. We'll have you back in another year or two when you've got some new stuff to share. All right. Her name's Suzanne Fanning. She told you I'd get a hold of her. My name's Damien Mason. Until next time, it's the business of agriculture. Thank you for tuning into the business of agriculture podcast sponsored by Land Trust. Land Trust partners with farmers and ranchers to capture pure profit from sportsmen seeking new experiences and places to hunt and fish. Land Trust built the platform and does the marketing. You maintain 100% control of access and activities, and you set the rules. There's no cost or obligation when you list, and the next 10 Business of Agriculture listeners who go to landtrust.com BOA are eligible for a gift worth over $2,000.